The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's start. So, back to our Isaac model. And for this lecture, focusing mostly on a square lattice. At each side, we have a binary variable. And uh, a weight that tries to keep neighboring uh, sides to be parallel. So every pair of neighboring sites is subject to a joint weight such as that. We are going to ignore the magnetic field. And to calculate the partition function, we have to sum over all two to the n configurations of n sites. And this will give us a partition function that would depend on this one parameter k, which is some energy divided by kt. So then what we did was uh, we rewrote each one of these factors as a hyperbolic cosine 1 plus tangent and took out all of the factors of the hyperbolic cosine to the outside. And for the case of the square lattice, each side has two bonds going out of that. <coughs> so there's 2 to the n. And I have to sum over all 2 to the n configurations product over all bonds these factors of 1 plus t sigma i sigma j, where this t is, of course, my shorthand for the hyperbolic function. OK. Now, we saw that basically what we need to do is either we pick 1, and that's the trivial term, or terms that have these factors of t sigma sigma. But in order to ensure that they will survive the summation over the two possibilities of sigma, each one of these terms has to be matched with another one. And so the most trivial diagram would be something like this. And then summing over the two possibilities at each side will give us a factor of n per side. So we have 2 to the n cosh k to the power of 2n. And then we have a sum over graphs which have 0, 2, or 4 bonds emanating per site. So that the summation over the sigmas will give us uh, a factor of 2 and not a factor of 0. And then we just have to count t to the power of the number of bonds in the graph. Okay. Now we said that all of the exciting things have to do with this sum, which depends on this parameter t, of course. And this sum, as written here, has graphs such as the one that I indicated, but also potentially graphs that are more complicated, which have disjoint pieces. And we were tempted to replace this sum S with another sum S prime, which is the sum over gas of phantom loops. Let's call it multiple phantom loops. Essentially, if I allow these loops 
to basically go through each other. Then I can exponentiate this and write it as uh, a sum over all single phantom loops, thereby removing the factors of n squared, n cubed, etc., that would arise by moving the, gra uh, the disjoint pieces all over the lattice. This sum, since I can essentially pick a particular loop and then slide it once over the lattice, is certainly extensive proportional to n. So this would be nice. We calculated this sum as prime last time. And we saw that uh, it actually reproduced for us the Gaussian model. So this was equivalent to the Gaussian model. And in particular, because we were allowing this phantom condition, when we went to sufficiently low temperature or when T became sufficiently large, essentially the model was unstable because I could just continue to put more and more of these loops there was no condition that would say you should have a finite density of them. The density of the loops would go to infinity. And just like the Gaussian model, it doesn't make sense beyond some point. Now, mathematically, it is clear to us that S is not equal to S prime because of two important reasons. One of which, which is obvious, is uh, uh, multiple occupation of a bond. That is, in the original sum that I have up here, we can see that the contribution of each point connecting neighbors is either one or one factor of t. I cannot have more than that. But when I'm calculating phantom loops and I allow self-crossings, I have some things that are very trivial, like I can start and go back on myself. That completes a block. I can have things that are more complicated. I could have a diagram such as this that still involves crossing a bond, uh, something twice, or something like this is another example. Now, all of these are examples where I essentially continuously moved my chart and drew a closed loop. But also from the exponentiation, I will also generate things that have multiple loops such as this loop that does not intersect itself, but may happen to intersect on a bond with another loop. So it is the, partly the presence of all of these things that allow multiple occupation that ultimately leads to the instability. But I also hinted last time in response to a question that there is another mistake that is involved, not when there is intersection at a bond, but intersection at a site. This leads to overcounting. This is somewhat less. Uh, it's more subtle. Uh, among the diagrams that I have in S is certainly a completely good diagram such as this one, where I have from this side four bonds going out rather than the two usual bonds. So this is certainly OK. But when I want to represent that in terms of uh, box on the lattice, I notice that I can do the following. Let's say in all cases, I start from here. I can start from there. I can go and do something like this. 
and come back to my starting point. Or I can do something like this. Come back to the starting point. Or I could have a diagram that would occur at the second order in the expansion of the exponential that I have that involves two loops that would correspond to the same geometry. So this thing that should have been counted once is really being counted three times. And so that's a mistake to be corrected. And actually, the reason for this factor of three goes back to this Gaussian model that I said, that essentially what amounts to is that we are replacing Ising variables over here with these Gaussian variables s. And so we arrange things such that the average of s squared was 1, so that the sites were replacing, reproducing the things that I had before. But then for something like this, I need to know the average of s to the fourth. And if you use Vick's theorem, you can quickly see that average of s to the fourth is three times average of s squared. So you get a factor of three here. That's the origin of the factor of three. And indeed, if you had gone and done rather than one component s, something that was n component, you could convince yourself that this becomes n plus two. And that's consistent with whenever you see something that has a loop having a factor of n, something that we had seen when we were doing these diagrammatic expansions. OK, so that's the problem. Fine, so s is not equal to s prime. But I want to make the following very nice assertion that S is indeed the sum over multiple phantom loops just like I had written for S prime with a couple of important constraints. The constraints are, maybe I should write them in red, with no U-turns that is, you are not going to allow anything such as this or this where you would go forward and then immediately step backward. That's what I will call a U-turn. No U-turn is allowed. And more importantly, with the factor of minus one to the number of crossings. Okay? So what do I mean by crossing? If you follow what I did in drawing this diagram, you can see that there was a path that I drew that never crossed itself. Whereas here, I kind of had to jump over where I was. I indicated that. So according to this rule, this diagram will get a factor of minus. These two diagrams don't have any self-crossings. They get factors of plus. And you can see that at least this particular diagram is resolved. And you can see that uh, this continues to more complicated things. Let's say that I have a perfectly good diagram that is something like this that involves two crossings. Then I can break it roughly into two pieces. And each piece I can decompose as I had done before as, uh, let's say, I can, the left part, I can 
either uh, do this without crossing, or I could cross, or I could have this part as a separate loop from this half, and then I can join it on the other side with essentially any one of these things, like this, which comes with a plus, this, which comes with a minus, or this one that comes with a plus. So you can see that this particular diagram of S in S prime would arise in nine possible ways. So I would have had an overcounting by a factor of uh, not, uh, three pair crossing or nine total, except that now when I assign these factors, some of these diagrams will come with minus, some of them will come with plus, but ultimately only one will survive. This is it. All of them survive, but the net contribution is just one, which is the correct one. Okay? So, now let's see. So this removed problem B. So this was a uh, problem B resolved. Let's see about our problem A. which had to do with multiple occupation of a particular bond. So these are diagrams that will appear in S prime that have no counterpart in S. That is, let's say there is this bond that is occupied twice, so that would be a contribution by a factor of t squared. And then this part can go and join and do whatever it wants. This part can go and do whatever it wants. The point is that for every diagram such as this, I can construct a diagram where I leave everything out here exactly as it was, everything out here exactly as it was, except that the two terminals that I have to the left and the two terminals that I have to the right of the bond, rather than joining them this way, I join them uh, like this. So this complicated diagram, as far as this bond is concerned, I can prescribe in two different ways using uh, graphs of S prime. And one of them, with respect to the other, has an additional factor of minus 1. And so they will give us 0. And you can convince yourself that the same construction will hold if I have three terminals, four terminals, etc. It doesn't matter. I will do it for one pair, and it will be OK. The only time that I wouldn't have been able to do is if I have two terminals on one side and one terminal on the other side, which is these guys. And that's why I said no U-terms. So now that's taken care of, of course. So this problem A is now also resolved. OK? So what do we have? We have now established that S well, let me just give a symbol. Let me define this loop star to be the loops with no U-turns and minus 1 to the number of crossings. Okay, so that's the star is going to symbolize that these two constraints of no U-turns and minus 1 to the power of number of 
crossings are imposed in construction and calculation of the contribution of these objects. Okay? So then what do I have? I have that S is, well, there's possibility of no loop. There's the one loop graphs. There's two loop star graphs, multiple loop star graphs. And just as in the case of S prime, I can exponentiate this as the sum of all one loop stars. And you may wonder what happens when I go to higher order terms. In higher order terms, potentially, I will generate two of these things that cross when I go to a second order term. But then any intersection will involve two, four, and even number. Minus one to an even number is one. So there is really no additional interaction to worry about if multiple things are crossing each other. OK? All right. So we could exponentiate that S of t that we have over there. We are interested in taking the log of the expression for the partition function. I will get a factor of n log 2 hyperbolic cosine squared, because there are essentially two bonds per site. And then I have a sum over these loop stars. OK? Essentially, I took the log of the expression that I had before. Now, this sum, well, let's sort of take care of this factor of n. So I divide by n. Log z divided by n is log of 2 hyperbolic cosine squared of k plus well, the way to get rid of the factor of n in this sum is to fix one point of this loop so that it doesn't go all over the place. So let's say that I have the number of loops that start and end at the origin. I would have to sum over the length of those loops. And those things will give me a factor of t to the l. So I have defined this n star of l to be number of loop stars from zero to zero in L steps. Okay. So implicit in this, actually maybe I will emphasize is minus one to the number of crossings and no U terms. Okay. Now again, so what I have is my entire lattice. Let's say I have a loop that is of length 4. And now I have forced it to start and end at the origin so that I can pull out this factor of n. But then I realize that I could have overcounted this because this loop could have been started from here, 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 and translated to the origin. So just as we saw for the case of the random walk loops before, there is this uh, factor of L to correct. And when I'm talking about walks, I can either go clockwise or counterclockwise. So I have to divide by a factor of 2 to get rid of that. OK? Question, what's 
question. Yes? Um, so what happens if we have, if we're doing our exponential loops and we have one loop nested inside another loop that are multiplying together so that they share one of their edges? It seems like then they don't have to cross twice and so we would still need something to cancel them out. Uh, okay. I should have maybe explained that graphs a little bit more, but uh, let's do it over here. So when I exponentiate S, uh, what I'm calling it, uh, S, uh, this sum of the loops, among the terms that I will generate will certainly be something like this. And then you say this one is shared yeah. between the two of them. OK. At the level of one loop graphs, there was a one loop object that went like this. OK. So yeah. the statement that I made here does not necessarily map the number of loops to each other, but it is correct and the cancellation occurs at the level of one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Actually I should have also indicated what's happening with the other graph that I have up there. It is I have this graph. So that's a one loop graph and that cancels against the this graph. Right, so whatever you do, you can just follow the rule that I gave you and show that the cancellation does occur. So thank you. I wanted to say this and I had forgot. OK, any other questions? OK, so essentially we are back to some extent to the formula that I had for ordinary random box <coughs> and phantom loops. These are partly phantom loops, but uh, I have to take care of something like this. What did I go originally last lecture rather than my ordinary graphs to these phantom loops. The reason was that for land, uh, phantom loops, I said that I had this Markovian condition. I could relate L step walks to L minus one step walks because there was no memory. I didn't have to know where I had crossed before. But it seems that in order to give a correct weight to these who loops, I have to know how many times I crossed myself. So this is a NC by itself is a non-Markovian thing. It requires memory. Except that I don't need NC. I need only the parity of the number of crossings. And here is where there is a beautiful mathematical theorem that helps us turn this uh, memory-like problem to something that is Markovian. And the statement is a theorem due to Whitney's. Which states that the, the parity of a planar group, the thing that I want here, whether it's even or odd, parity of the number of crossings is related to the total angle through which the tangent vector turns by the following, NC mod 2, which is the parity of the crossings, is 
1 plus this total angle that I will call theta divided by 2 pi mod 2. Okay? So, I'm not going to give a proof of this, but I will show you examples to make sure you understand what's happening. Uh, by, let's say, comparing uh, the following two graphs, one of which has no crossing, and another one, which is essentially the same thing, but has a crossing. So basically, I put an arrow, uh, so that I can follow where the orientation of the bond, which is the location of this tangent is, as I step, let's say, from the origin, this is the first step, second step, third step, fourth step, and so forth. So let's do this for the upper graph. And what I will do is I will plot the angle. And the first step here, I start at uh, zero degrees, pointing this way. So this is my step number one. At the next step, I have gone to 90 degrees. So this is where I'm at two. At three, I'm back to pointing along the horizontal direction. At four, I have gone back up here. At five, I go to 180 degrees. At uh, six, I go all the way down. At seven, I go back to this horizontal. At eight, I go back to pointing down. And then I'm back to one. Okay? So if you follow what that tangent is doing, it is going whoop, whoop. At the end of the day, it has turned through two pi, right? So in this case, the total turn is two pi. One plus the total turn divided by two pi, in this case is one plus two pi over two pi, which is two uh, mod two, which is the same thing as zero. And of course, how many times has this thing crossed itself? Zero times. So let's see how it works if we were to apply the same set of rules to this other one. OK, so again, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 are my steps. 1 is pointing in the uh, uh, horizontal direction, 2 goes vertical, just as before, uh, 3 stays the same place. So I, 2 and 3 are at the same point. 4, I go back to horizontal. 5, I go down to uh, minus 90 degrees. 6, I go all the way to 180 degrees and stay there at 7. 8, I go back to minus 90 degrees and then rejoin the origin. So this goes up, down, back, never completes a full term. Okay? So in this case, theta is 0. 1 plus theta over 2 pi is 1. And the number of crossings of this graph is 1. So you can go and repeat this for any graph that you like and convince yourself that this rule works. Okay. Well, how does that help us? 
Well, the diagrams that I have drawn here already tells, tell you how it helps us. Because in order to find the total angle, all I need to do is to keep track of local changes. So essentially, as I go along, I carry a bag with me which adds the change in angle at every step. I don't need to know where I was 100 uh, uh, steps before. I just add another change in angle. By the time I get to the last uh, stop, I figure out what my total angle is, and then I'm uh, done. Okay. Yes? So is it really the total angle that matters, or is it more just the number of circles that you complete or not? They are the same thing. So if you prefer to s say it in terms of uh, uh, the entanglement of your loop and the point at the origin, that's another way of saying it. It's a, this entity divided by 2 pi is a, a topological number, which counts essentially the number of times you have gone around the origin. OK? So, uh, So what I'm saying is that minus 1 to the power of the number of crossings, this factor that I was after, I can write as e to the i pi times the number of crossings. And it is evident that the only thing that is important here is the parity. So I can replace e to the i pi, the number of crossings, with 1 plus this total angle divided by 2 pi, which means I have e to the i pi, which is a factor of minus 1. And then I have e to the i theta over 2. And my statement is that this is the same thing as e to the i over 2 sum over the little bits of change of angle that you have as you go along the loop. OK? So what I have to do is, as I'm walking along this square lattice, I better keep track of which direction I'm pointing so that I know from one step to the next step whether I change by 0 degrees, 90 degrees, minus 90 degrees, etc. So what do I do? I define a convention. Uh, so we are going to introduce orientation mu of step as follows. So let's say I'm at some point on the lattice, i. Then I can, in principle, proceed along one of four directions. And I'm going to label them by mu being equal to 1, 2, 3, or 4. You can choose any notation you want. This, is, this will be notation I will use. Okay. Secondly, I'm going to introduce the analog of the quantity that we had for the phantom random box, which was I introduced a set of matrices that were counting how many ways I can go from one site to another site in L steps. So I will introduce the following notation something that involves these start box that involves L steps. And I say that I start at some point x, y, and I end at some other point x prime, y prime. So again, just counting how many ways I can go from one to another point. Except that I also want to keep track of these orientations. 
So this quantity is defined as follows. It is the sum over random walks that start at xy along mu. That is, if this is my point xy, and I'm looking at the second element of this, the next step I have to go up. If I have specified that mu equals to 1, it means that the first step I have to go to the right. OK, as I go further on the lattice, I ensure that I never have any U-turns. And uh, I keep track of the factors of e to the i theta that changes as I take one step to the next step. So that if I took my first step here, and then the next step I continued here, there would be no factor. But if I went up, I would have a factor of e to the i pi over, two, uh, pi over 4. So I keep track of those factors. And then I want to end at x prime, y prime, and head along mu prime. Since I specified that my first step will then go along mu, when I reach the last step, I already know where I came from. But depending on which direction I specify I would turn to and head for my next step, I will get a change in angle. So I have to include the change in angle <coughs> somewhere so that there are L changes in angle. So the way that I have defined it, it will be essentially keeping track of where the next step is headed. Okay. So again, if I, if I were to draw a diagram, I start with this x, y point. And I want to arrive at some point here, let's say x prime, y prime. And I want to do in L steps. And the first step, I go along the direction that is specified by mu. So this is step one. And there's step two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's say the last one, so this would be step L minus 1. This is the last step arrives me at point x prime, y prime. But then I have to specify what is the direction mu prime so that I keep track of the appropriate change of angle that I have to do over here as well. So this is the procedure. Now, this walk, this quantity that I have defined for you here, has the Markovian property. In that, if I arrive at this point after L steps, then after L minus 1 steps, I was at some point x double prime y double prime, from which I took one step along some direction mu double prime and arrived at this. So I can write that I have to sum over all possible locations and orientations of the before to last point. I start from the point x, y, proceed along direction mu for a total of L minus 1 steps landing on x double prime, y double prime, and then going in direction mu double prime. So then I have a walk that started at x double prime, y double prime, along the direction mu double prime, which in one step has to get me to my destination. And once I'm at the destination, I head along direction mu prime. Okay. 
So this is clearly a matrix uh, product. And what I have established is this matrix W star of L, which, by the way, is a 4n by 4n matrix, because there are n points and four orientations. So it's 4n by 4n matrix. And I have established that that is the product of the matrix that I have for one step and the product of the matrix that I have for L minus one step. And this object that I will call T star essentially tells me something about the combined connectivity orientation that I have for the square lattice. And since I can repeat this many times, I can see that I have the result that I want, that W star of L is simply T star raised to the power of L. OK? Questions? Yes? Uh, have we accounted for loops that um, <coughs> the imaginary of the square loop of four steps and then the same square loop of eight steps that are exactly on top of the four step one? OK, so you want me to take this and do it again? Yeah. OK, so you can. I can certainly do something like this. And there's, of course, I can do the same thing over any one of the bonds. So, but they all, there's always cancellation. Yes? Doesn't, in the end, become kind of like transfer matrix method that on soccer data? I mean, just no. I mean, it will reproduce the result that on soccer had. But the transfer matrix that on soccer had uh, was. Uh, uh, essentially going from column to column. Its size was 2 to the n times 2 to the n. This is 4n by 4n. It is vastly smaller matrix that I have to look at. OK. All right. All right, so uh, maybe we should just write down what this matrix T star is. So T star, I said, is this 4n by 4n matrix that tells me how going from some side x, y, I arrive at some other side x prime, y prime. But it also has orientation information. So really, I should have four of these for this and four of these for this. So it's actually a four by four matrix that I have once I keep track of orientation. So let me write down the four by four matrix explicitly. So here I could have a mu, and this mu could be one, two, three, four, which again, specifically I have indicated as this, 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 and this. And along the other direction, I can arrive at new prime. And once I have arrived at new prime, I can either go forward, up, left, or down. So essentially what this says is start with the site xy, head in the horizontal direction. Since this is a one-step walk, 
After one step, I will be arriving at some other point. Once you arrive at that next point, head continue to head horizontally. The next element says head to the right and then go up. The next element says go to the right and then start heading back. The next element says go to the right and then go down. Okay, now we can construct the rest of them. Up, right, up, uh, up, up, left, up, uh, down, left, right, left, up, left, 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 down. Lastly, down, right, down, up, down, left, down, down. So you do your aerobic exercises. And then the next stage is to actually write down the numbers that these correspond to. So first of all, you can see that, uh, I'm not sure whether I will have enough space, but let's hope that I do, that in the first row of this matrix, your first step was always to the right. So always you uh, start from x and you end up at x plus 1, while y does not change. So I will indicate that by x plus 1, uh, Actually, what should I write it? Uh, yeah, x prime, y prime. x prime has to be x plus 1. y prime has to be y. So I have introduced a notation that says x prime, y prime, x, y means delta x, x prime, delta y, y prime. So essentially, you just read off for x prime, y prime, what the new points have to be. And I proceed forward, there is no change in phase. The next one, I arrive at the same point, so x prime, y prime is x plus one, y. But now, my tangent vector, my heading, has shifted by 90 degrees. So I have to put a factor of e to the i high over four. The next one, I try to go back, but I've said U-turns are not allowed. So this matrix element is 0. The next matrix element, I have x prime, y prime, x plus 1, y. Now I have headed down, so minus 90 degrees, the change in angle is minus i pi over 4. The second column, you can see that essentially y coordinate has to change by 1, increase by 1. So I have x prime, y prime being x, y plus 1. And this element has a change of angle that corresponds to minus 90 degrees. So this is e to the minus i pi over 4. The diagonal element continues to head straight. So there is no phase angle associated with that. The third element heads in the opposite direction. So the phase element for that is uh, e to the minus i pi over 4. The fourth element is a u-turn, so it will give me 0. The third column starts with a u-turn, which is a 0. The next one, you can see I have to step to the left. So x prime has to become x minus 1, while y does not change. The phase factor is e to the minus i pi over 4. Along the diagonal, there is no phase factor. And if I already had 1 e to the minus i over 4, I should have e to the i pi over 4 for the last one. 
and the last element corresponds to y decreasing by 1. Uh, so I start with x prime, y prime being x, y minus 1. Uh, the first phase that I have to do, I can kind of read how things go diagonally. Uh, this is i pi over 4 to the i pi over 4. Uh, the next one has to be 0 because the zeros you can see are proceeding diagonally. The next one would be x prime, y prime, x, y minus 1, e to the minus i pi over 4, and then x prime, y prime, x, y minus 1 for the last element. OK? So this keeps track of the changes in phase, right? So. Now the next thing that we did when we had the ordinary random walks was we took advantage of the uh, translational invariance of the lattice to go to Fourier space and make diagonalization. And indeed, we can do that over here too, but only partially, in that this object has two sets of indices. There is the lattice coordinates and there's the orientation. But what I can certainly do is to diagonalize the subspace that corresponds to positions. What do I mean by that? What I will do is I will introduce, let's say, qx, qy, xy, these Fourier elements which are e to the i qx x plus qy y divided by square root of n, just as before, without any orientation component. Then you can see that if I multiply this object qx qy xy with this matrix that I have over here, xy t star x prime, y prime, and sum over x and y, but leave the orientations unchanged. That is basically, I do this individually for each one of these 16 elements of this matrix, that each one of them clearly depends on x, y, x prime, y prime, but also has some additional factors. In each case, what is going to happen is that because I'm shifting x or y by one step, I will get this factor back up to e to the i q x, e to the minus i q x, e to the i q y, e to the minus i q y, exactly as we, I was doing before. Except that I will have to do this for every single one of them. So you can see that essentially what this reproduces is a matrix that is 4 by 4 that depends on q and then I will get x, y, q, x, uh, q, y, actually x prime, y prime, because I sum over x and y back. OK? So what is this matrix T star of q? It is very easily constructed from what I have over there. Because you can see that in the first one, what happens is that when I see uh, x, I will change it to x prime, which is x minus 1, right? So from here, I will get a factor of e to the minus i q x. y and y prime are the same. I don't get anything from here. Next one, I will get e to the minus i q x minus, uh, plus i pi over 4, 0, e to the minus i q x minus i pi over 4. The next column, the y has been shifted by 1. So I will get e to the minus i q y minus i pi over 4, e to the minus i q y, uh, e to the minus i q y plus i pi over 4, 0. The next level, the third one, x prime is set to x minus 1, so I essentially get e to the i q 
qx. Uh, oops, third element starts with 0. And then I have e to the i qx minus i pi over 4, e to the i qx. And then I have e to the i qx plus i pi over 4. The fourth element is e to the i qy uh, plus i pi over 4. 0 e to the i qy minus i pi over 4 e to the i qy. Okay? So in the position space, I had this 4n by 4n matrix where the different sides were connected to their neighbors with these phase factors. I have gone from coordinate to Fourier basis, so I did this transformation. Now I have a matrix that is block diagonal. So for each value of the Q, I have a 4 by 4 block. So in the Q picture, imagine that you have this 4n by 4n matrix, and you have blocks of 4 for different Q along the <coughs> diagonal. Each one of them is this. OK? So now let's go and calculate our partition function. So what do we have? We have that log z over n is log 2 hyperbolic cosine squared of k plus 1 half sum over L. Sum over L of these loops that go back all the way to themselves. So this is t to the l over l. This is loop star of length l. I want to relate loop star of length l to this w star of length l. But I want to start and end at the origin. So I start from the origin and end at the origin. But I have to be careful, because let's say I make a loop such as this, and I end up at the origin. I have to get the right phase factor. So if I started along direction u, when I get back to the starting point, I cannot head this way, this way, and get the right phase factor. I have to go and head in the same direction as mu. Right? So I have to head to the same direction. OK? Now, I can certainly do this as a summation also over the starting point. Who said I have to start and end at 0? I could have started and ended at any point. And then I do a sum over x, y, and mu. But then I better divide by the n, uh, right? And the reason I do that is because now you can see that the structure of this is uh, like a trace. And I like that. Actually, I read, I made a mistake when I did uh, this. Because you see, the factor that I had to really include is minus 1 to the number of crossings. Uh, but my WL star is just keeping track of e to the i delta theta. Actually, I should have put in here a delta theta over 2. So I had forgotten that. But you can see that that factor 
is different from minus 1 to the nc with a minus sign. So there was that minus sign that I had forgotten, and actually I better make this a minus sign. So what was plus before becomes a minus because of this factor that I have over here. Okay, so let's write this again. This is log 2 hyperbolic cosine squared k minus 1 over 2n and then this sum over x, y, mu is like a trace. And what is it that I'm tracing? I'm tracing a sum over L t, t star to the L divided by L. Um, yes? So we are also summing over mu, which gives a factor of 4? No, because uh, I don't know which direction my first step is. So what I'm doing is I'm summing over all ways of starting, say, at, from the origin, head in direction mu, then I have to make sure that I come back to mu. Now, it is true that I sum over mu, but I already took care of that when I divided by 2L. Because let's say we look at the diagrams of length 4 that I generate through this procedure. Starting from here, depending on which direction I go, I will generate this, or this, or this, or this. These are the precisely the four diagrams that I generate depending on which starting point I pick. So it is true there is a, 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 an overcounting, but that's an overcounting that we've already taken care of. OK? Now, again, we did this last time. This is the series for minus log of 1 minus t, t star, matrix t star. So this is the same thing as log of 2 hyperbolic cosine squared of k plus now 1 over 2n uh, trace of log of 1 minus t, t star. Okay. Now I said that my matrix was block diagonal when I went to look at the Q basis. And I can take the trace in any basis, whether it's in coordinate basis, in momentum basis, trace is trace. So now focus on what the trace will look like if I go to the Fourier basis. I have these four by four blocks. And when I calculate the trace, I will calculate the trace of one four by four, the other four by four, I go all over all cubes. So basically this can be written as a sum over q's log of uh, 1 minus t, this 4 by 4 matrix, t star of q, and the trace of that. OK? And finally, oops, I forgot the factor of 1 over 2n here. The sum over q. I'm going to replace with an integral over q times n over 2 pi squared. So the final answer here is going to look like log 2 hyperbolic cosine squared of k plus 1 half the 1 over n I will get rid of when I write the sum over q as n integral d2 of q. So I have integral d2 of q divided by 2 pi squared. One more step. Uh, trace of a log of any matrix, I can write, let's say we find a basis in which the M is diagonal, then it becomes a sum over alpha log of M, uh, lambda alpha. 
the lambda alphas are the eigenvalues of this. But sum over logs is the same thing as product or log of the product over alpha of lambda alpha. In product of eigenvalues of a matrix, you also recognize to be the determinant. So this is the log of the determinant of the matrix. So this is a very useful famous identity that trace log is the same thing as log determinant that I will use. And rather than calculating trace log, I will write it as the log of the determinant. And I will explicitly write down for you the determinant of which 4 by 4 matrix. It is simply 1 minus t times the elements of that matrix. So it is 1 minus t e to the minus iqx minus t e to the minus iqx plus i pi over 4. 0 minus t e to the minus i to x minus i pi over 4. Second element, second row, minus t e to the minus i q y minus i pi over 4. 1 minus t e to the minus i q y minus t e to the minus i q y plus i pi over 4 minus t, oops, 0 for the last element here. It's a U-turn. The third uh, thing is 0 minus t e to the i q x minus i pi over 4. 1 minus t e to the i q x diagonal element minus t e to the i q x plus i pi over 4. Final row. Uh, minus t e to the i q y uh, plus i pi over 4. 0 for the u-turn. Uh, minus t e to the i q y minus i pi over 4. Diagonal term 1 minus t e to the i q y. And that's it. And that's the answer. So calculating the partition function of the two-dimensional Ising model is reduced to calculating this 4 by 4 determinant, which we can do by hand. I won't do it here. I will write the answer. So log z over n is log 2 hyperbolic cosine squared k plus one half integral d2 q 2 pi squared log you take the determinant and what you find is one plus t squared squared minus two t one minus t squared cosine of qx plus cosine of qy if you want you can write it in a slightly different way by taking the cosine squared inside this logarithm and doing the uh, little bit of algebra. You get log 2 plus 1 half. Explicitly, these are integrals that go from 0 to 2 pi, because that's the range of q vectors that are allowed by this transformation. I have a q in the x direction. I have a q in the y direction, 2 pi squared. Each one of them goes in the range 0 to 2 pi. I have a log. Once I take this cos squared inside, it becomes cos to the fourth. You write this t as sine squared divided by cos squared. You can see that the cos to the fourth will cancel this. You will get cos squared plus sine squared which is the same thing as hyperbolic cosine of twice the angle squared. And the other term uh, conspires to give you the shine of 2kx, and then cosine of qx plus cosine of qy. And so this is the partition function 
of the two-dimensionalizing model. Okay? You can do a little bit more manipulations, write this integral in terms of special functions, but you, you won't gain much. So this is the answer. I want you to absorb and appreciate this derivation. And next time, we look at this and see what it means for the singularities and the phase behavior of the two-dimensionalizing one. Yes? Uh, in the bracket, in the log, it's cos squared minus inch, right? Yes. Okay. But both of them went to twice the angle. Here, everything is in terms of k. Once I took the hyperbolic cosine squared inside and did the manipulations, they became twice the angle. Uh, to there shouldn't be any sub subscript. Yes. Is there like an extension to higher dimensions where you just do like a summation over cosine? You would wish, right? I mean, that's <laughs> actually <laughs> and quite a number of people have come with that conjecture, including myself, when I was a graduate student and I didn't know better. It is very, if you sort of write things in terms of not only uh, the, if you make kx and ky to be different, then this takes the form of cosh 2kx, cosh 2ky. This becomes, in some sense, a very nice version of doing kx and ky. There is a very natural, and, and the thing that is nice is that if you put any one of the two kx's to zero, then you reproduce the formula for the one-dimensionalizing model as you should. And then the natural thing would be to write a similar pro a product in three dimensions, and indeed when you set one of the k's equals to zero, you get the correct two-dimensionalizing model. So it passes a number of tests, yet it's uh, unfortunately not correct. The problem with transitioning this to three dimensions is counting the loops? Uh, what we relied on heavily was this factor of minus one to the power of the number of crossings. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it as a topological entity, these crossings make sense only in two dimensions. So you don't have the basic tool to go in three dimensions. And actually, what that those minus signs mean, I will explain next time. It has something to do with fermionic character of this theory. OK? Yeah, it's a beautiful result. You should, should appreciate it. Yes? Uh, I'll go through the history, too. I mean, the person who first derived this result, uh, this the energy was on Sager through this transfer matrix method that I described. Uh, this way of doing it in terms of graphs came much later. And uh, a number of people were involved with that, including Feynman. In fact, uh, in Feynman's book, there's a very nice derivation along these lines that you can see. Uh, the connections to fermions, then a number of people, Mattis, Schulz, Lieb, etc., came up. One thing that, uh, well, okay, I guess I have a few minutes, I can uh, say a few things. So, uh, this result dates back to around 1950s. And uh, I know a generation of physicists who are now about to retire or have retired in the past 10 years or so, who were very young when these things were introduced. And as far as I can see, all through their life, they did versions of this. So you can sort of do versions of the two-dimensionalizing model in which you can make the interactions to be different. You can play with different types of interactions. You can make uh, the boundaries to be different, periodic, etc. There's many variants that you can find, and there are some people who seem to have done that throughout their career. And, uh, but then uh, after that, we had the renormalization group, and then a totally different perspective. And so 